Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar, Next Gen Commercial Water Heating, How to Double Efficiency and Eliminate Bulky Storage. This event is brought to you by PM Engineer and sponsored by IntelliHot. I'm your moderator, Mike Miazga of BNP Media's Plumbing Group, which includes PM Engineer, Plumbing and Mechanical Magazine, Supply House Times, and Reeves Journal. And we thank you for joining us this afternoon. Today's presenter is Sridhar Davis Sigamani, President and CEO of IntelliHot Green Technologies Incorporated. And before we begin, this course is approved for one learning credit hour of AIALU slash HSW. To qualify for the credit, you must watch this webinar in its entirety and complete the quiz at the end of the session. For a link to that quiz, uh, please click on the handouts icon at the bottom of the screen. BNP Media is a registered provider with the American Institute of Architects Continuing Education Systems. Credit earned upon completion of this program will be reported to CES records for AIA members. Certificates of completion for non-AIA members are available by completing the exam at the end of the session. And for a link to that exam, please click on the handouts icon at the bottom of the screen. This program is registered with the AIA CES for one learning unit as such. It does not include content that may be deemed or construed to be an approval or endorsement by the AIA of any material of construction or any method or manner of handling, using, distributing, or dealing in any material or product. This pre presentation is protected by U.S. and international copyright laws, reproduction, distribution, display, and use of the presentation without written permission of the speaker is prohibitive. And before I uh, go ahead and introduce Sri, um, a couple of uh, learning objectives from this webinar. Uh, number one, uh, current tank and boiler designs. How did we get here? What is needed for water heating systems to work as tankless or on demand? The true impact of draw profiles on traditional tanks or boiler setups? how to size tankless, how to eliminate over-design or unneeded redundancy, and how self, how to self-learning optimizes systems. And right now, I'm excited to turn it over uh, to the, today's presenter. Here's Shri, and how are you doing this afternoon? Hi there, Mike. I am doing very well. Thank you for, for the introduction. And uh, we're, we're happy to have you, and uh, look forward to hearing your presentation here. Okay, very good. I am very excited to be here. Hello, everyone. This is Sridhar Devasigamani, and when I was born, my folks were very excited to see me. So they used all the alphabets to come up with my name. Uh, so I'm going to clue you guys right off the bat. I think there is a question on how to spell the presenter's name at the end, so please make note. Uh, but a little bit about myself. I am a mechanical engineer by background. Uh, I worked for Caterpillar for many years, working on marine engines. Uh, autonomous machines, robotics, and I quite fell into this industry by accident. Um, a water heater broke and flooded my house, and I was really surprised at how much of engineering from uh, diesel engines and, and marine engines and robots have applicability to boilers and water heaters. So that's what I'm here to share with you, and I certainly appreciate the opportunity. Now, we all know that hot water is a basic human need. And, you know, it, it wasn't that long ago that, you know, we, we did not have hot water. Uh, it was scarcely 100 years ago, or 150 years ago, if you were, um, uh, you know, if you were very, very rich, you took a bath twice a year. And if you were not so well off, you took a bath once a year. And since that time, uh, we made lots of progress. But the way we heat water has pretty much remained the same uh, in the last 150 years, which is we store water in a vessel and uh, we might light a fire underneath. So there is a reason why we heat water the way we do. The first and foremost reason is our bodies are excellent detectors of changes in temperature. And <clears throat> for example, when, uh, when somebody has a fever, you know, a baby has a fever, the first thing you do is 
you reach out and you use your hand and see if the temperature is right. And what we have found through scientific study is the human body can detect changes in temperature within plus minus five degrees. We all know what happens, obviously, if you don't have hot water. Um, you have angry customers, you have lost revenue, and your really uh, smiling customer starts to look like a giant bear. So what do we do? We end up uh, storing water and storing water and storing lots of water. And if you ask yourself, why do we do it? Uh, the fundamental reason is uh, to have temperature stability. And uh, the second reason is we also have a, a comfort feeling, know that you have hot water when you need it. So we have three methods that we use predominantly today to heat water. The first one is a tank style, where you have water in a tank, light a fire underneath. Uh, another method is using a boiler and a storage tank. And uh, the third way is using a boiler and directly heating water in, in a tank. And there are a lot of commonalities between these three methods. Uh, they're all equally or highly inefficient. They're all susceptible to scaling. Uh, and as you very well know, they are big and bulky. It might need reinforced floors. And if you wanted to retrofit one, you might have to helicopter one in, tear the roofs. But more importantly, they are homes to our friendly Legionella bacteria. Now, Legionella is, is, um, is a bacteria that loves temperatures from 98 to about 122. And uh, so the most you know, common sense solution seems to be let's crank up the temperature. And here is where the problem is. No matter how high you crank up the temperature, there are spots within these storage vessels which happen to be between, let's say, 98 and 122. And so Legionella starts growing there. Um, the other thing that exasperates this growth is uh, any formation of biofilms. And biofilms are the slimy stuff you find on, on, you know, on pipes and vessels. And that happens because water is not flowing or there's stagnation in water. And if water doesn't flow, it doesn't shear that biofilm, and it promotes growth of this bacteria. So takeaway, no flow equals biofilm, and obviously uh, uh, with a tank, with the scaling, uh, you, you promote biofilms and you promote these low temperature zones to, uh, to have Legionella. So the question um, I think we are all asking ourselves is, isn't there a better way we, we, today? You know, we are able to put a man on the moon, but we are still heating water the way we did uh, 150 years ago. And uh, since you don't want to go back and obviously meet that angry bear with the bad teeth that I showed you earlier, uh, to mitigate the risk of reliability, we install multiples. And predominantly, this is because we want, we want to make sure there is enough hot water. We want to make sure that we have adequate capacity. But that comes at the risk of having leaks and obviously uh, Legionella. Now, the question I have asked myself is, every building I have been, uh, or maybe the question to you is, have you ever seen when these multiples are installed that one of them is actually turned off and you know, kept as a standby? So I haven't seen one. So what do you think is going to happen when one fails? Um, how long does it take before the other ones fail? experience has shown us it's, it's relatively quick. Uh, when the first one goes, the other one seems to follow suit uh, in, in a relatively short amount of time. So, we, you know, the question is, is there a, isn't there a better way? Is there a way we can eliminate leaks, Legionella, and obviously eliminate the risk of running out of hot water? And uh, the answer is, well, maybe. Just common sense question is, why don't we simply heat water when we need it? Why don't we eliminate storage and just put it through a pipe and heat it? So it is possible, but there are a couple things that are fundamentally needed from these type of systems. 
the most common word used for that system is tankless. So you need to have uh, a system that is durable. Uh, just by definition, let me turn on the device when water is being used, uh, suggest that the device would come on and off, uh, resulting in a lot of thermal cycles. So it, it, the device has to handle thermal cycles. The device has to be reliable. Uh, by that, I mean you never, ever want to be out of hot water, either because your equipment is down or either because there is some control system that's not working. Whatever may be in the end uses, your customer should be happy and you should always have hot water. Uh, this system should also have precise temperature control for the reasons I mentioned earlier. Uh, the human body detects plus minus five. And uh, the fourth one is we want it to be robust to scale. So if you pulled up a map of the US, you would see that the majority of the water is classified as either hard or very hard. So we want these devices to be robust to scale. And uh, we also want these devices to look like existing, uh, existing systems, which happen to have very low pressure drops. And I'll explain further on why that is a, a very important uh, item. So if we have a device that all, does all these five, well, maybe we can have, uh, have an on-demand uh, or tankless system. So question is, does such a device even exist? And uh, we found an example. And I want to share with you some features about this design, which, which were quite intriguing. What you see there in that picture is a stainless steel finned tube uh, heat exchanger that has zero welds on the water side. There is no weld, absolutely. So there is no issues of stress corrosion cracking, uh, no issues of corrosion, uh, any of the other associated welding related issues. This whole coil is then suspended in air. And what that allows it to do is when you fire uh, the heat exchanger, and in this design, uh, if you see, cold water enters at the bottom and comes out as hot water at the top. And the little cylinder you see there in the center, that's a burner which fires radially outward. And by having this heat exchanger float, we are able, the, this design fires immediately and, and go through a lot of thermal cycles without the heat exchanger breaking down. There is another interesting property in this by making the design floating, which is you're able to vibrate the heat exchanger. And I'm sure when many of you were kids, do you remember when you went to the doctor, if you had a fever, the doctor gave you a little bottle of medicine, uh, perhaps penicillin, which was pink. And if you looked on the bottle, it said, shake well before use. And the reason it said that is uh, when you shook the bottle, the medicine uh, went back in suspension. And so this design does the exact same thing. The heat exchanger vibrates and keeps any scale that's precipitated, uh, puts it back in water, and as a result, nothing accumulates. The last of which, uh, uh, which this design does, there is no stored water, there is no variation in temperature, uh, there is no cozy place for Legionella to stay and grow, and water is moving, uh, you know, moving continuously. So effectively, we have made Legionella homeless with this design. Now, the other thing we need for on-demand or tankless is to achieve precise temperature control. So how do, we, how, how, how do we achieve precise temperature control? Many of you might have heard of PID control or what's referred to as classical controls. Uh, it's a proportional integral derivative. It's a, it's a really, really good type of control system as long as your inputs don't change. Those type of systems are designed to operate at one, one point and one point alone. To operate at other points, you have to add a lot of bandages to the system. And as you very well know, if you had a boiler or a tankless system, the flow changes, the temperatures will change, the gas calorific value will change. So PID certainly doesn't apply, and it, it creates a very unstable system. And what is really needed is a system that is capable of learning the patterns, is able to, in effect, anticipate, I'm in this kind of an application, I'm in a hotel or hospital, I have seen flows change at such a rate, 
so let me take action A or action B. And once the system learns and adapts itself to uh, the particular application it's in, you can very, very uh, easily achieve temperatures of plus minus four, thereby uh, uh, looking like it, it, the water came from a large storage device. Now, simply by having a heat exchanger and temperature control does not mean you can go tankless. There's one more thing we have to do. Now, if any of you, and I'm sure many of you have, have been into large buildings, and I'm always amazed when I walk into one of those uh, and I see miles and miles and miles of piping, lots of PRV valves, uh, lots of devices, uh, pressure boosting pumps. And if I were you, I am really afraid to put in any device that looks even remotely different than what was in there before. And the pressure drop is, is a huge concern. Uh, it is possible, and this device, uh, in fact, is able to achieve a pressure drop that is comparable to tank, in fact, better than the tank. And the way it does that is sort of like the Prius. Uh, I'm sure many of you have driven a Prius before. So when you get in a Prius, even though you know it runs on batteries for the first few, uh, you know, up to 20 miles per hour, as soon as you take your foot off the throttle uh, or the brake, the vehicle starts to creep forward. And the reason they did that is because they want you as the user to really think that it's a regular gasoline-powered car. Now, this device here, by achieving a pressure drop that looks very much like a tank, does exactly the same thing. So we are able to use pump and valve control to essentially rate shape the pressure curve. And once you do that, voila, you got a, you got a drop in replacement uh, a water heater uh, for every building. As far as the rest of the plumbing for the building goes, it really doesn't know whether it's, it's sitting on a, a tank heater or a tankless. Now, there are a couple other things that uh, if we think back and see how are we doing the way we are doing things, uh, uh, we think about reliability. Now, the traditional way of approaching reliability is let's put in multiples. And obviously, if you put in multiples, if you put in 2x the capacity that you need, you, you spend 2x the money. But as you're all familiar, there are still uh, sudden and single point failures. What I mean by that is uh, a lot of these devices are controlled by a single master controller. And when electronic controls was designed, uh, this sort of goes back to the dates when, you know, the serial communication and USB and TCP IP, all the chips were designed. They were designed to be a master and a slave, meaning one device talks, the other device listens. And so when we designed boiler controls or heat exchanger controls, we used the same chips. And so you have a master controller controlling a bunch of other devices. Uh, we installed those devices uh, thinking we're going to have more reliability, but what has really, in effect, happened is if the master controller fails, you wiped out your entire bank of units. And this is a very common real-life experience. If you ever go in a building, you might see a bunch of elevators that are out. They're all controlled by master controllers. You go on a cruise ship, you find a bunch of gen sets. They would be controlled by a master controller. So all that leads to a single point failure. And uh, people have tried to address it by creating pseudo masters, secondary masters. But manual intervention to turn them on essentially means the first time you hear about it is by meeting that bear uh, with the bad teeth. So that's too late. So isn't there a better way? Well, again, perhaps. The approach is what if, instead of doubling our equipment, what if we figured out what the capacity required us for the building, and let's say it's two units. And in that two units, we took capacity and divided into small chunks. Uh, if you remember, when, when we started off, I, I mentioned robotics. And here is where things get really, really interesting. By creating these devices as modules and essentially creating them to be robots, uh, you can have these devices talk to each other without having a central master controller. 
and uh, they can figure out when to come on, when to go off. You're able to do all that without doubling your equipment cost, and you also at the same time eliminate any sudden or single point failures. Now, how does this apply to what happens in the real world? And I have a couple slides I want to share with you on how water is consumed, uh, at least what we have seen. So water really, water consumption really follows what's called, what I call statistical law. Uh, the water consumption is transient, uh, meaning flow rates go up and down. There are periods in which there is no water consumed. Uh, water flow rate might increase or decrease. The example I'm showing you here is a 320 bedroom hotel with three uh, full service restaurants and also an in-house laundry. Just experience tells us, well, um, you know, this hotel, when it's fully occupied, 320 rooms, I bet that thing consumes, you know, 150 gallons per minute. But when you put a flow meter on and you actually measure it, you find that 100% or 95% occupancy, you measure about 55 gallons per minute. Now let's do a deep dive into how that 55 gallons per minute peak load is actually consumed. And if you zoom into that plot and you sort of do a little histogram, things start getting really, really interesting. So in the table I'm showing you there, I have classified flows as low draws, small draws, medium draws, or high draws. Now if the flow rate was between zero and five, it's called low, five and 20 small, uh, and let's say high draws is between 35 and 50. Now it happens when you do an analysis of this data, majority of the time, almost 71% of the time, the flow used in the building sits between zero and five GPM, which is low draws. And 23% of the time, uh, it is in, in the small draw range, that is between five and 20 GPM. So you got equipment that is like a big, big, big bulldozer, which you're trying to use it to go from stop sign to stop sign and make this big equipment work on really, really, really tiny flows. What do you think is going to happen? This equipment's going to turn on, reach temperature really quick, turn off. And it's going to do that about 94% of the time every single day. And especially with devices that have turned down, low turndowns, this is exasperated. And so you have equipment damage and you have huge purging losses um, and the device really cycles itself to death. Now, let's say that that's fine. Let's, you know, let's just, let's, let's just see what happens. Um, the net effect <clears throat> from having a draw profile uh, uh, like the one I just presented to you where 23 out of 24 hours you're sitting at either low draws or medium draws is that the equipment operates in pretty much what I call a non-condensing range in addition to turning on and off. And the reason is why, uh, is why. Here, if you see, I'm showing you a boiler and a typical storage tank setup. We keep the tank at, let's say, 160 degrees. We have a a, a mixing valve, bring the water temperature to 130. Um, we put in a pump, and let's say the pump runs at about 30 GPM. 71% of the time, let's say you got water coming in at this low flow at 5 GPM. The water that is actually going to the boiler uh, ends up at 155 degrees. And in effect, what you're doing is you're sending uh, really hot water and converting this condensing boiler, if it is a condensing boiler, into a non-condensing boiler. So the way we arrived at this conclusion is, is by running some simulations. And we ran simu dynamic simulations uh, which sort of came from our past lives uh, uh, in uh, working on engines and, and robotics. 
If you ran a dynamic simulation on a storage boiler and a tank system, it turns out that for a 96% thermally efficient boiler, uh, and let's say it's paired with a 500 gallon tank, uh, if you, for every 100 bucks you spend uh, in heating water, $8 simply goes through the roof in purging losses. Uh, what I mean by purging is you have a million BTU boiler with a million BTUs worth of surface area. It quickly reaches temperature, it shuts off, and then it has to purge to expel the, com uh, the combusted products. And it uses fresh air for that. And when it does that, it uh, in effect is cooling that heat exchanger and has converted that entire heat exchanger into a, uh, into a heat exchanger in the reverse direction, sucking heat from the water and then putting it out through the stack. So eight bucks goes out. The other 12 bucks goes out in just operating the boiler as a uh, 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 non-condensing boiler. So that's wasted. So we have lost 20 bucks there. And another 12 bucks goes because of standby losses, because we are keeping these tanks at very, very high temperature so that our Legionella friends don't have a home. So, so you know, th there seems to be a tremendous amount of losses that are involved. And I, I want to give you a little bit of a flavor for how these simulations uh, were done. Next slide, please. Okay, what you see on the screen is a picture, uh, it's a fairly detailed dynamic model of a boiler and storage tank system. I, I won't get into the details here, but it suffice to say that this system uh, adequately represents what a boiler uh, and a storage tank and all the associated draws, uh, losses uh, that are happening. And what we did is we took the draw profile, the blue chart that I showed you earlier, we took real data from the field and we ran it into the model to see what kind of results do we get. And the results from those dynamic models are, is what you see. So a 96% boiler ends up really running at about 68 or 67 percent. And there are a couple things I'd like to draw your attention to. If you look in the table down below, you will see that for a 5 million BTU boiler, uh, let's say paired with a 500 gallon tank, um, it, has, it has about 500,000 uh, worth of purging losses and it has almost 800,000 BTUs of efficiency losses. And if you look to the column on your right-hand side under the tank list, those two numbers are significantly smaller. In fact, if you have a modular tank list and with a very, very high turndown, those devices are able to run continuously and nonstop, you in effect have zero purging losses. And because you are not storing water, um, the only uh, uh, the, the only standby losses is just water in the pipes. Your uh, standby losses are also minimal. So, in effect, we are able to achieve almost uh, when you when you spend hundred dollars, you're able to achieve ninety one dollars going into heating water. Now we have taken this and we have gone to the field and we have seen what happens in, in real life. So the next slide I'm going to show you is a picture of a hotel outside San Francisco Airport. And I'm sure you might have driven by this hotel. This is a 400-room hotel. Um, uh, looks pretty nice. And what they did in this hotel is they had 12 million BTUs of steam and they decided that when they were converting to tankless, 
they, they wanted to go with 11 million BTUs. And they, they just simply replaced like for like, uh, or like for slightly less than like. And they recorded in the, within the first month a 62, 66% drop in gas, and it went as high as 72%. They did oversize equipment, meaning they could have run with a lot less. But the interesting point to note here is if you oversize tankless, and even if you put in modular tankless, it has no impact on operational efficiency. Now, if you were to do that with a tank or a boiler system, if you doubled or tripled it, it would have drastic effects. So we, whatever our simulation showed, we were able to see that uh, in real life. The next slide I'm going to show you involves a correctional facility. And in this correctional facility, they had 1 million BTU boilers along with a 1,000 gallon storage tank. And when they converted to tankless, they simply, simply put in a million BTUs worth of on-demand. And this is an interesting thing. The reason the, this correctional facility wanted to go to a modular design was they said, look, luxury. Hot water is very critical for us. If we don't have hot water, we have the prisoners very upset. Uh, and when they get upset, they kill each other, and sometimes they kill us. So we need reliability. And so they put in these systems. They, they achieved a very high rate of reliability. And simultaneously, they were quite shocked that they were able to cut their gas consumption almost by 43%. And so the rate of uh, return on investment for them ended up being something like 18 months. There are other advantages to using an, a tankless system. And the next slide I'm, I'm going to show you uh, depicts hospitals. So you've all seen, seen in the news that Legionella uh, has raised its head again. And uh, pretty much that is, a lot of cases have been reported in cooling towers. But it should be noted that Legionella does pose a risk, certainly a very much a risk, in domestic uh, hot water systems. And what we are seeing is that hospitals are moving to uh, tankless systems for predominantly two reasons. Uh, one, they're able to eliminate mixing valves. They're able to eliminate storage. And uh, if you eliminate storage, you eliminate Legionella risks. Uh, providing you know the rest of your pipe work is good. You eliminate mixing valves. You're able to eliminate parts, costs, um, uh, annual maintenance and service, and also the unreliability that comes with these type of components. The next slide I'm going to show you is a multifamily. This happens to be one of the tallest. It's the second tallest building now in Chicago. And they had lots and lots of storage on the 62nd floor. And they seem to have, uh, multifamily, they seem to have the same issues as uh, you know, the hospitals and medical facilities, uh, the same Legionella risks, the same risks as you know, not having hot water. But ROI was also very, very important and attractive uh, to, this, to, this, uh, to this segment. And uh, they converted 2,000 gallons of storage uh, to completely on demand, and they're able to satisfy and meet the demands uh, of their users. So to summarize how we see hot water is used, uh, we have gone and we have flow metered uh, different types of applications, uh, hotels, schools, uh, hospitals, restaurants. Uh, the takeaway message is just about in every application, the flow that is being demanded is transient. It follows what I call transient laws of statistics. And in mo all these applications, it is possible for, for us to go tankless. Now, there are applications where tankless doesn't make sense. For example, if you had a bus wash or a car wash where you dumped 100 gallons in, in 5 to 10 seconds, and then you had a long layover, 
and you came back and you dumped another 100 gallons after an hour. Uh, I would suggest that for those type of designs, it's probably better to use, uh, especially with no human contact, better to use uh, uh, storage type devices. If you take a look at the graph on the lower left, that one depicts a uh, flow that is used in a 800 bedroom hotel in Boston. Uh, 800 uh, room hotel with two restaurants. This hotel recorded a peak uh, flow of 108 GPM. And this was during full occupancy. And the flow was measured for, for several days. The next graph to the right is a 400 room in San Francisco. They recorded 51 GPM. Uh, we call that an 8.5% diversity, full occupancy. The graph above that is a 100-room hotel. It was almost 100% occupied, 93%. And here is where things get a little interesting. With a slightly lower number of rooms, the diversity ticked up a notch. It's now at 14%. The lower right-hand corner was flow recorded from an apartment complex, 41 apartment complex. And not much surprises there. Uh, they recorded 15 uh, GPM peak load for a diversity of 9.5%. Uh, very, very similar to some, some uh, uh, hotels. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, people you know, might take showers in the morning or evening. So that seems to be in line with our expectation. The, the plot above that is from a fast food restaurant, similar to, let's, you could call it, let's say, a restaurant like McDonald's. Now, restaurants generally, from our experience, have a higher diversity rate. And it's very, very probable that they leave majority of their faucets and sinks and things open. So these guys had almost a 15% diversity rate. So we take all this into account when you design your tankless system. And the critical thing to note here is you don't obviously want to oversize. And at the same token, you don't want to undersize. Now, the next generation type of tanklesses have several advantages in addressing just about all these applications. And I'd like to share with you what those, what those advantages are. Now, the first one is by approaching these type of draw profiles. Uh, like I mentioned, schools, hotels, hospitals, nursing homes, restaurants, multifamily. If you took the approach of modular tankless design and uh, you split capacity into several modules, uh, when your flow is less, you might only have one engine firing. And because you are uh, feeding in cold water to that engine, it would be running in fully condensing mode. Now, let's say your flow rate increased. Now, when your flow rate increases, these type of devices automatically, through a set of distributed controls, which, which I called masterless, are able to automatically turn on additional modules. And so there is a uh, stepless uh, change uh, as more and more flow is required. Uh, you have additional capacity that just comes on, on. So it is very similar to, let's say, pay as you go. You only fire the number of modules needed depending on the flow that is being demanded. Now, when you hit peak capacity, it is possible that all the units turn on all the time. And, <clears throat> and <clears throat> in this case, uh, in this image, you can see all the engines are running. Uh, they, you're able to meet your peak capacity without having to double your equipment, but at the same time, achieving almost four times as much reliability as you would with any other system. And the reason is quite simple. Through a combination of modularizing devices and also having control strategies like masterless, uh, and fail safe uh, and having things automatically rotate uh, and isolate themselves, we are able to achieve a very, very high degree of reliability. So let's say in a system you had um, eight engines that are running. If one of the engines had an issue, 
it could automatically hydraulically isolate itself and it would tell the, all the other guys much like robots do uh, look I have some issue I'm dropping off the chain you guys take over and the other ones regroup and uh, continue running so seven out of eight are still running which means you have almost 90 percent capacity and if you had 90 percent capacity uh, that really means you're good almost 23 out of 24 hours a day which allows you to you know schedule service and maintenance calls and all the other things also this type of approach with masterless controls allows the units to automatically rotate uh, and achieve equal rates of wear and tear so with this you have been given an introduction to what the future looks like what the next generation tankless that that's currently available might look like and if you recall when we started this this class today we had a couple objectives uh, the first was that the big one was none of us really wanted to meet the big ugly bear with bad teeth so we wanted to eliminate the risk of not having hot water now that was achieved by having a, an extremely robust heat exchanger design by having a modular design uh, also by having a very smart learning control system and a masterless type of control system uh, we talked about Legionella risk that was eliminated by uh, eliminating the biofilms by eliminating scaling by eliminating any uh, cold spots uh, let's say 98 to 122 so that's gone we were able to eliminate mixing valves so you can set tankless to the desired temperature and the impact really is no annual maintenance and the no uh, uh, no unreliability in your system you were of course able to eliminate leaks and flooding since there are no tanks and the net result of all this is, is quite simple you spent you you're able to cut your capex in 50 percent and you're able to save anywhere from 30 to 62 percent uh, on your operational expense now that's that's the kind of ROI I personally like from my from my IRA account I've never seen anything even <laughs> remotely approach that uh, that would be nice now the last point is since these modular systems are very compact and very lightweight uh, with buildings getting smaller uh, the boiler rooms shrinking uh, people wanting things to fit through doorways and not having to helicopter in it, it is becoming important that equipment be lighter and nimbler and smarter and uh, you certainly can reduce your footprint almost 80 percent by going to modular tankless so with that that brings me to my last slide I'm happy to entertain any questions and if you have any specific questions once we get through some of the questions that are presented online uh, please feel free to uh, reach us directly and we are, we are happy to answer any and all questions thank you well Sri that was an awesome presentation and we'll uh, we'll get to these questions right now that have been submitted from our uh, from our attendees today we'll start out with um, a true and false question here to begin things um, and this um, audience can chime in here I guess uh, through the uh, answering through the um, submitting their answer through the um, questions box there true or false I'm only here because my boss asked me to I don't think tankless systems really work All right. I, I think so I, I, I'll have to agree <laughs> all right uh, what here's an, here's a good one here what is the annual maintenance required on these tankless systems compared to tank type so interestingly uh, the general maintenance you see from a lot of systems might include you know uh, cleaning out you know cleaning the electrodes for example uh, if you think about electrodes uh, the reason electrodes predominantly fail is through warpage and the reason they warp is because of uh, cycling equipment on and off you fire the boiler at full rate and then you instantly hit the electrode with nice cold air and so you promote the electrode to to warp what we are seeing in tankless designs with especially with devices with high turndown if you are able to fire it continuously 
things like uh, maintaining electrodes uh, end up having a much, much longer service intervals. So the things that do require annual uh, maintenance tend to be clean the water strainer, uh, clean the air, strain, uh, air filter, uh, very, very common sense uh, things. Can tankless heaters be installed in high-rise buildings and power very large applications? Uh, yes. Uh, the picture that I showed you earlier, the one from Chicago, and I'm going to make an attempt to go back to that slide. That one was in a high-rise 62-story building. And the peak load for that building was about 52 GPM. But that building also had, an, uh, had very, very complicated plumbing um, uh, and had lots of PRVs and mixing valves. Uh, they had 200 horsepower pump VFD drives for pressure boosting and recirculation. And the recirculation was something like three times of what the peak load was, uh, almost 175 GPM. And the tankless system that was installed accommodated all these things. Uh, it, it met the capacity. It met the pressure loss requirement. It handled the varying loads. And um, uh, it, it, it's a, it was a successful uh, installation that showed that it is possible for very, very large applications and even applications that have very complicated and scary uh, plumbing schematics. If your equipment, as far as the rest of the plumbing goes, if your equipment looks to the rest of the equipment like a regular tank, uh, but you also get the benefits of on-demand modular, uh, it is possible. And we have done it. Why does tankless eliminate mixing valves? So fundamentally, uh, the question, I think, is <clears throat> what is the best approach to perhaps address Legionella? So people have tried all kinds of approaches. Uh, obviously, the most common one, which we are all used to, is let's just boil water, and that ought to kill everything. And it is true. It does kill everything. Uh, if you kept water above 160 degrees, Scientific studies show if you introduce Legionella into water that was 160, it kills Legionella instantly. The only problem with that is you're, you're wasting a lot of energy. You are putting your devices through high temperatures. Uh, and there is a lot of wear and tear at, at, as temperatures go up. As we all know from the old anecdote, isn't prevention better than a cure? So how do we prevent stuff from happening? Well, one way is just looking at the root cause. The root cause for Legionella is having temperatures between 98 and 122, uh, having these really nice lukewarm zones, uh, which are very, very common in a stratified tank, uh, further exasperated by having scales. Uh, anytime a scale is formed, the temperature tends to drop in that region. And even if you put a, ta a, a pump on that tank, uh, the water velocity tends to be pretty close to zero. And immediately, Legionella is quite happy, biofilms start to form, uh, and that, that, that promotes it. In a tankless design, what you do is the water is flowing continuously, and the shear stress uh, generally tends to be in uh, what, what we call um, a turbulence region. It's always able to shear off any of these biofilms. Uh, in the design I shared with you earlier, there are no scales formed. There are no uh, cool spots or temperatures between 98 and 122. So there is no Legionella risk. And so you can simply punch in the temperature you want, and uh, you can eliminate mixing valves. The other reason is also when your return temperature comes back, by having a modular design, that design is able to continuously fire and maintain your research temperature very, very close to what the set temperature is. So the device, by being modular, tends to run continuously, even when just the research load is on. So no mixing wells. Another question here, when you're, when you're saying tankless, how much storage volume do the boilers themselves have? The, the designs I showed you earlier, uh, the one that had those four engines, uh, that, that, uh, that's about a million BTUs. And it has something of the order about one and a half gallons, just water, whatever water is there in the pipes. 
How do you maintain a hot water loop temperature when the system is recirculated? Right. That, that's what I, I just mentioned earlier. The, and I'm again going to make an attempt to go back to one of the previous slides. So by, by having uh, this modular design, you're able to fire anywhere from, let's say, as low as 30,000 BTUs and as high as a million BTUs. So when you're simply recirking, uh, you just need to produce enough heat to top up the heat loss. And depending on the building size and the recirculation flow rate and the insulation and, and all those other things, uh, it might uh, need uh, 50, 60, or maybe 100,000 BTUs. And a tankless design would just fire nonstop continuously without cycling and uh, maintain that recirc at, at the right temperature. What is the estimated minimum number of life cycles of a tankless heater? Uh, well, the the design that I shared with you earlier, um, uh, and, and I can give you some life cycle numbers. Uh, when we went to the field and we measured life cycles, uh, we found some some very very interesting data. The one of the most harshest applications for life cycle turned out to be restaurants, where they use a lot of hand sprayers, and uh, the devices uh, there, the devices turn on and off because you're continuously, you know, putting in cold water into the tank, uh, just a just a tiny amount, and then you turn off. And it is possible to accumulate almost six to seven hundred thousand cycles uh, in about nine months. And we anecdotally went back to what does a typical residence have? And it turns out the number of cycles you get in a residential application uh, it takes almost 11 years. So uh, it is fair to say uh, in, in uh, restaurants, high cycles, uh, in uh, multifamily and uh, hospitality segment, the cycles are more self-induced because of a mismatch between the turndown of the boiler and what the draw profile looks like. Uh, and uh, you again start getting into these very, very high cycles. Uh, I've been in boiler rooms where the boiler turns on once every 45 to 50 seconds, fires for maybe 5 or 10 seconds, and shuts off. How important is water quality with tankless systems? So, it, so water really affects, uh, obviously water can have all kinds of contaminants in it, and the interesting thing about this is when I worked in marine engines, uh, you're out in the ocean with, with, with a big diesel engine. All you got is dirty water, <laughs> lots of sharks, and an engine. So we looked at all kinds of ways on uh, how do you make these things very, very robust. And the same things, interestingly, apply to water heaters uh, and boilers. Uh, you really have to attack the source. Uh, uh, the water quality uh, might affect uh, might affect uh, scaling. It, the water quality might affect your welded joints. So if you have uh, a welded joint and you have high chlorides, you might have stress corrosion cracking. So question to be asked is, is there a way to address the root cause? So why don't we eliminate welding? Uh, I'm going to put in a lot of cycles. Why don't we have a floating design? Uh, I'm going to have a lot of scaling. Well, is there a way to completely eliminate scaling once and for all? And if you have such a design where the root causes are addressed, then uh, th there is no need to worry about water quality. I think we have time for one more quick question here. Um, how does building recirculation affect the efficiency? Yes. So building recirc obviously comes back at, let's say, you set the boiler or water heater to 140 degrees. It might come back at um, at uh, uh, 130 degrees. And so you are feeding the boiler higher inlet temperature. And it is true that the boiler uh, probably operates uh, to, in a range of uh, near condensing or almost non-condensing. But the interesting thing is when you have a modular design, 
and you are able to fire continuously uh, and all you have to heat is this tiny uh, modular heat exchanger you have completely virtually eliminated your purging losses and if you recall that slide uh, and I'm sure this will be posted online um, the slide where I talked about purge losses so for a 5 million BTU unit um, the purge losses were almost half a million BTUs so you can eliminate purge losses completely and uh, it works extremely well uh, in fact I can't imagine having any other better way of doing it other than modularizing equipment uh, especially for research Wow, a lot of uh, just a ton of great questions that we don't have uh, run out of time on if anyone's question was not answered the IntelliHot staff will uh, get back with you individually and make sure that everyone's uh, anyone that answered a question here today um, We'll get those uh, get those uh, questions answered for you. And this concludes uh, today's webinar. Uh, please join me in thanking Shri for his great presentation, as well as our sponsor, IntelliHot. Um, as you exit today's webinar, please take a few minutes to complete the survey that I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar. We strongly welcome your detailed comments to help us serve you better. And if you have any additional questions or comments, please contact webinars at bnpmedia.com. Any specific inquiries on today's presentation or for future business opportunities, click on the Schedule an Appointment button above the audio panel to have someone reach out to you. Please visit webinars.pmengineer.com for the archive of this presentation as well as information about our upcoming events. We appreciate your time and hope you have found this webinar to be a valuable experience.